powerful and deadly invasion. Killing machines wielding deadly heat rays and poison gas. The largest city in the world devastated within hours. This was the nightmare that H.G. Wells foretold more than a century ago. A story made even more terrifying by the fact that the marauders were creatures from Mars who fed on human blood. And as fantastic as the story was, it struck deep-rooted fear in everyone who read it, and much later caused legendary panic in the streets of America. Why then does this story continue to terrorize us? As modern probes discover more and more about the Red Planet, how close to the truth is this work of science fiction? This is the real story behind this tale. A journey beyond the War of the World. How can I describe it? A monstrous tripod, striding over the pine trees, smashing them aside. A walking engine of glittering metal, articulate ropes of steel writhing from it, and the clattering tumult of its passage mingling with the riot of thunder. And the attack from Mars begins in a story by a young British author, H.G. Wells. First appearing as a magazine serial in 1897, The War of the Worlds grips readers from page one. The War of the Worlds was a shocker. And all of a sudden you have a novel where Martians are invading tranquil British countryside and wreaking havoc upon it. I think this was something that was quite extraordinary. The magazine sells out quickly. And when The War of the Worlds is published as a novel in 1898, it becomes an instant bestseller, playing on the paranoia of the British Empire at its precarious height. At the end of the 19th century, England was certainly the most protected and most powerful nation on Earth. Then yet there was afoot a sense that this was a fragile peace, that there were forces abroad that were menacing the British Empire air warfare, people would drop bombs on England. England was not this invulnerable island, but it was quite, on the contrary, quite vulnerable. And Wells took it one degree higher by simply associating the War of the Worlds with Martians. The idea of a Martian invasion in Victorian England is not only a good story device, but seems a real possibility to his readers. Wells is putting into words thousands of years of curiosity and fear about Earth's next door neighbor. At its closest, Mars is scarcely 35 million miles away and a third the size of Earth. Of the nearby planets, it is the easiest to identify as it stands alone, scarlet in the night sky. 5,000 years ago, the ancient Egyptians are the first to record its presence in the sky. They call it Har Desher, the Red One. Four millennia later, the Babylonians call the planet Nergal, the Star of Death. The Babylonians are also the first to record that the planet has peculiar motions, as if it is under something's or someone's control. If you were an ancient person watching the sky, there are two aspects of Mars that would be most likely to bring thoughts of war and terror to your mind. First, the fact that it swells up in brightness dramatically when it comes near the Earth, so that it dominates the sky and then fades again. And then, of course, the reddish color. The ancient Greeks named the planet Ares, after their god of war, one of five heavenly bodies they call the wandering stars. Ancient people believed the stars were very far away and sort of incomprehensible and by giving the planets and the stars a character, they somehow enabled us to relate to them, which I think is a very important underlying thing that human beings need to do, to relate to the universe, to feel that we mean something. As early as 250 BC, the Greek astronomer Aristarchus of Samos makes the bold claim that Ares is one of several planets, including Earth, that revolve around the sun. But the Roman astronomer Claudius Ptolemy insists in 100 AD that the planets and stars revolve around Earth, and that is the theory that sticks. 
and so does the Roman name for the planet, Mars, the god of war. Well, it's perfectly natural to think of the Earth as the center of the universe because the Earth feels stationary and solid to us. It's the center of our existence, and the sky appears to be a dome or the inside of a sphere with things moving across it. Earth as the center of the universe is a comforting explanation for 1,400 years, until 1543, when a Polish astronomer named Nicholas Copernicus sets the scientific world on its ear. Copernicus in the 1500s gets the credit for being the first to make a strong case that the planets go around the sun, not around the Earth. This theory means that Earth is just another planet orbiting the sun. So scientists wonder how much the other planets might be like our own. This is the beginning of real scientific inquiry into the possibility that we are not alone. In 1609, German astronomer Johannes Kepler explains the strange movement of Mars by proving it has an elliptical orbit and wonders if this may be the next planet upon which we will find life. He writes, Who shall dwell in these worlds if they be inhabited? Are we or they lords of the world? In 1610, Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei is the first to observe Mars through a telescope. In his one-inch lens, Mars is the size of a pea held eight feet away, but it is impressive enough to sustain the idea of life on other planets. To the naked eye, without the aid of a telescope, a planet just looks like a bright star. And yet when Galileo looked at the planets through a telescope, he found they were not stars, they were tiny worlds like the Earth. Over the next three centuries, telescopes gradually improve. And so does the scientific evidence that Mars could be another Earth. 1877, we had what is called an opposition of Mars. Every two years, Mars comes closest to the Earth and is brightest in our sky. And that's generally the best opportunity to observe it. During this close approach of the red planet, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli publishes sensational new maps of the surface of Mars. If you look at the drawings of Schiaparelli, they're absolutely beautiful. They're a work of art, as well as being a work of science. But the most interesting thing was his drawings of straight line linear features on the surface, which he saw, and which he wrote in his paper were a canali, which again, Italian means channels. He entertained the possibility that they could be artificial, but he certainly was open to other interpretations. In 1892, a French scientist, Camille Flammarion, cites more evidence of life on Mars. He discovers what he calls the wave of darkening during the Martian spring, when dark patches on the surface spread from the poles to the equator and then recede at the end of Martian summer. Flammarion theorizes that this darkening may be caused by vegetation changing with the seasons. As the scientific evidence grows more compelling, wild theories about the possibility of intelligent life on Mars capture the public imagination. And the imagination of writers who feature space travel and Mars in a new genre called science fiction. People consider H.G. Wells and Jules Verne to be the two fathers of science fiction. And between the two of them, they created some of the, the basic ideas that we've all taken so many times from time machines and invasions and uh, Jules Verne of course came up with the, the really cool technology with the submarines and the flying airships. Their collective dreams inspire one of the first motion pictures ever made, Georges Méliès' From the Earth to the Moon. The 1902 film envisions an advanced lunar population of man-sized insects ruling a cold, desolate world. But the most popular works about life on other planets don't come from science fiction. They come from amateur astronomer Percival Lowell and his best-selling series of highly speculative books about Mars, which aspire to be science fact. And those books took the world by storm. He had his convictions and he just bulldozed over anybody who got in his way. And he wrote these books about Mars and life on Mars. and they 
became extremely popular books at the time. Heir to an enormous textile fortune, Lowell travels to Flagstaff, Arizona in 1894, where he builds an observatory with a 24-inch telescope atop a mountain he calls Mars Hill. After a year of observation, Lowell theorizes that intelligent life has created waterways all over the surface of Mars. He called them canals, and they were, appeared to be very straight, linear features, and Lowell thought the only way these could have been formed was by intelligent life, uh, digging them to bring water down from the dry parts of the planet to, to water a dying planet. They had run out of water and resources, and it was very poignant that their cities were falling and that they, they couldn't survive very long. Lowell pictured Mars as a dying society. But many scientists scoff at Lowell's observations and accuse him of playing connect the dots with his telescope, for not everyone sees the elusive canals. Most of the professional astronomical community were not quite so convinced. Of course, the public loved it, the idea of Martians. Nonetheless, about a year after Lowell's first book about Mars is published, a young writer in London, England, puts pen to paper. H.G. Wells has paid close attention to Lowell's theories about a dying Martian civilization, speculates about their evil intentions, and creates literary history. No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's, who regarded this earth with envious eyes, slowly and surely drawing their plans against us. For centuries, astronomers have gathered scientific evidence of life on Mars. Now, in 1897, a hot new science fiction writer offers his own chilling interpretation. Had our telescopes permitted it, we might have seen gathering trouble far back in the 19th century. Men like Schiaparelli watched the red planet, but failed to interpret the fluctuating markings they mapped so well. While all the time, the Martians must have been getting ready. Herbert George Wells was born into a lower middle class family in southern England. Wells had a uh, quite an extensive scientific background. He was very interested in, in human evolution and the evolutionary process. He spent his early career as a somewhat unenthusiastic school teacher. Then in 1895, at the age of 29, Wells moves to a sleepy London suburb called Woking and tries his hand at writing. His first two novels, The Time Machine and The Invisible Man, combine his interest in science with social criticism and establish him as one of the most popular writers of the day. Great things are expected from H.G. Wells when his third novel debuts in 1897. His public is not disappointed. Amidst the thrill of alien invasion, the War of the Worlds suggests the vulnerability of the Empire. When Wells wrote The War of the Worlds, the British Empire was the big kahuna on the planet. They were the ones that conquered every country that they went up against, that they were the, the superpower. Wells offers a warning to an arrogant empire. The War of the Worlds is an allegory of this. these Martians misuse their own technology. They have this overpowering military might, but they misuse it, and therefore they fall. So, I mean, there is a sense here that we could do the same thing, that Wells is trying to teach us some kind of responsible use of all these things. This superior force arrives in a spectacular fashion. Hollow cylinders crash into a park just minutes from Wells' woking flat. Fascinated readers wonder what the Martians look like. It is not what they expect. The lid of the cylinder fell upon the gravel with a ringing concussion. A big, rounded, grayish bulk the size of a bear was rising slowly and painfully out of the cylinder. As it caught the light, it glistened like wet leather. Two large, dark-colored eyes were regarding me steadfastly. Wells portrays the Martians as highly evolved beings which use advanced technology to wage war on humanity. 
And worse still, the creatures are vampires. Perhaps more social commentary from Wells? Wells it makes certain analogies in his book to uh, how we treat the so-called lower animals and how the Martians treat us. The Martians feeding off blood, well, they're intelligent beings. You think, well, they wouldn't be doing that. But if we look at our own history, we're not that different. Is there that much difference between blood and blood and flesh? During this time, people are still fascinated with the theory of evolution. Are these creatures a future generation of man? If we look at Wells' depiction of the Martians, he is coming from a perfectly valid standpoint in terms of trying to extrapolate what directions evolution might take for an intelligent species. This superior race rides in giant war machines armed with horrifying weapons that unleash violent fury into the crowd. A thin rod rose up. A ghost beam of light seemed to flicker out from it. It was as if each man was suddenly turned to fire. And by the light of the fire, I saw them staggering and falling. The Martian heat ray renders humankind's greatest weapons useless. As the Martians begin advancing toward London, they reveal an even deadlier weapon that neutralizes Britain's army in an instant. Each of the Martians had discharged a huge canister, which smashed on the ground and disengaged a great volume of heavy, inky vapor, coiling and pouring upward in a huge ebony cloud. At the touch of the vapor, the inhaling of its pungent wisps was death to all that breathes. The stark reporting style of the novel adds to the terrible reality of the story. This frightening book is translated into dozens of languages and sells out around the world. Interest in Mars, both fictional and scientific, is increasing. The question that we're trying to answer is, are we alone? Well, suppose the answer is, no, we're not alone, there's other things out there. The next question is, well, is it dangerous? <laughs> what does it think about us? Obviously, our first concern is our own survival, and so fear is the great motivator. In 1910, even the scientific pioneer Thomas Edison speculates about what Martians might look like. Edison's vision of the Red Planet is a complete departure from his traditionally rational thinking. He brazenly disregards contemporary scientific notions of Mars for a wild fantasy of his own design. In 1926, Russia offers another view of the Red Planet when it releases Elita, Queen of Mars, written by a cousin of Leo Tolstoy. Mars again becomes a metaphor for evil, as Earth's first cosmonauts arrive on a planet where people live under crushing capitalist oppression. The space travelers land on Mars. They, of course, have come from Russia where the revolution has occurred, and they see an opportunity here to help the Martians and uh, improve their lot in life. In no time, they introduce the joys of communism and are soon on their way home to the Soviet Union. They wanted to make a movie that wasn't just about the revolution, but would be uh, sort of a very entertaining film as well. But soon, entertainment turns to horror as Mars prepares to invade the United States. In 1938, Mars invades New Jersey. The new medium of radio adds a terrifying dimension to the War of the Worlds. Halloween Eve, 8 p.m., Orson Welles' Mercury Theater is on the air. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. From the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza Hotel in New York City, we bring you the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. With the touch of the Spanish, Raymond Raquello leads off with La Compensita. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. At first, it seems like an ordinary broadcast of an evening concert. 
but news flashes in the program grow progressively more frightening. It is reported that a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millette and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. The original story took place in, in England, and Orson adapted it to uh, present day, and actually then put into it places and street names and locations and geographic regions that were in New Jersey, so that as people heard those names, of course it added to the realism of it all. I started to listen and I hear the music and then another broadcast that uh, they were hitting some town in New Jersey and you know, then I had opened my eyes and listened. In 1938, the idea of a fake newscast is unheard of to the listeners at home who start to become genuinely alarmed. Most have not heard the opening of the show, warning that this is only a drama. As the War of the Worlds program begins on CBS, many Americans are listening to a sketch by Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy on competitor NBC. But when the Charlie McCarthy skit ends at 8.12 p.m., an estimated six million listeners switch over to CBS. And what they hear doesn't sound like a dramatization at all. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again, out at the Wilmot Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Mr. Pearson and myself made the 11 miles from Princeton in 10 minutes. You didn't hear that first part, the world of the worlds. You didn't know what was going on. So a lot of people got excited when they heard it because they sounded like real uh, news flashes at the time. But I can see the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor. At least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. Has a diameter of... Um, um, what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, what would you say? Uh, what's the diameter of the... About 30 yards. About 30 yards. <laughs> Might be almost... Oh, 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 heaven. Something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one and another one and another one. They look like tentacles to me. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body now. It's large. It's large as a bear. It's just it's like wet leather, but... Hey, Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. Radio listeners on the East Coast start calling local police and radio stations but can't get through. The lines are jammed. The broadcast went on. Geez, they're talking about Plainfield and then Newark. I said, my God, they're coming closer. So I ran next door to Bonnie Walk. I said, are you listening to this? I'm not, you know, on uh, Orson Wells. He said, yeah, I'm listening. Let's go out and look. So we went out. We're looking all over the streets to see the... They were coming into Bayonne, which was right next door to Hoboken, and uh, we don't see anything. The streets are dark and deserted, but that's little comfort to the panicked listeners. And so the fact that, oh my gosh, there aren't any cars on the street, well, that would be a sign to most of us in rational times that it's a quiet night. But for somebody who is inclined to move toward hysteria, no cars on the street means that those people have already been harmed in some way. Wait a minute, something's happening. A pumped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. The Lord, they're turning into flames. I'm a hair shield caught up by the woods of fire. Of the 7 million listeners, it's estimated that 1.7 million believe the broadcast is real and 1.2 million panic. In Grover's Mill, New Jersey, many residents grab their rifles, and a few fire at a local water tower, thinking it is an alien death machine. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. Some people started storing food because of some sort of impending attack. Some people tried to leave the area and gather up the kids and rush out of the city. Others remain confident that a mobilization of the American military can stop the Martians. 
because, you know, uh, we were going to take care of them because we were Americans, you know. And them days we heard we won every war there was that we were in. Rumors run rampant. Many believe the invasion is not extraterrestrial, but part of the growing threat from the Nazis. A bulletin is handed me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside of Buffalo, one in Chicago, St. Louis. Finally, at 9 p.m., the attack is over. This is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke. People are trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They, they're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue, 5th Avenue, a hundred yards away. It's, it's 50 feet. 2X2L calling CQ. 2X2L calling CQ New York. Is there anyone on the air? The eerie silence is followed by an announcement that the program is a dramatization, but it's too late. The hour-long broadcast has convinced millions of listeners that the end is near, and the citizens fleeing for their lives tonight will be calling for the head of Orson Welles tomorrow. A 1938 radio dramatization of the H.G. Wells classic, The War of the Worlds, has thrown the United States into a panic. When listeners find out they have been duped, there are angry calls for a congressional investigation to prevent future fake news broadcasts. Orson Welles is blamed for the panic. Since it's identified with Orson because he was the voice and he did direct the show, it was the product of his directorial talent. But it was a fluke. He never expected to get out of hand that way. You want me to speak now? I'm sorry. The next day, a contrite Wells addresses the nation. Of course, we are deeply shocked and deeply regretful about the results of uh, last night's broadcast. It came rather as a great surprise to us that a story, the fine H.G. Wells classic about a mythical invasion by monsters from the planet Mars should have had so found an effect upon radio listeners. I remember now how worried he looked and how pale and sort of frightened. The FCC began looking into it, but I think there were some commissioners who were concerned about um, somehow infringing on freedom of speech and uh, radio's creativity, and so there wasn't really much done about it. And I think that even though Orson Welles had a fairly half-hearted apology, this made him very famous. And when you have fame, you don't apologize too much. But he did say, I don't think we'll try anything like this again. Orson Welles never admits whether or not the panic was premeditated. When asked, he merely smiled. Despite the furor over the 1938 broadcast on February 12, 1949, another radio play based on the War of the Worlds results in pandemonium in Quito, Ecuador. Tens of thousands of panic-stricken residents run into the streets to escape deadly Martian gas raids. Once the public realized that it was this hoax, they were pretty irate about it and, and stormed the radio station and actually burned the radio station to the ground. Fifteen employees of the radio station die in the fire. In July 1947, Newspapers report that alien bodies have crashed to Earth in Roswell, New Mexico. This sparks a worldwide mania for all things Martian. Please contact us. We are your friends. Scientists insist the Roswell spacecraft is a government weather balloon. But that doesn't stop a pop culture explosion of books and movies about flying saucers and aliens. We want to believe that we're not alone. We want to believe that there are other people out there. And so if you tap into that great reservoir, you not only have great entertainment, but you also validate these beliefs that we have. 
And the first big-budget science fiction movie in 1953 is an adaptation of The War of the Worlds. This could be the beginning of the end for the human race. For what men first thought were meteors or the often ridiculed flying saucers are in reality the flaming vanguard of the invasion from Mars. It was the first time they'd taken a really good science fiction story and coupled it with really good special effects. The film is a blockbuster the world over for its Oscar-winning visual effects and groundbreaking spaceship design. Well, those war machines in the War of the Worlds certainly were unique uh, for their time. They took this idea of a, of a craft from another world and uh, surprised everybody with this sort of organic notion. The very first movie I ever saw was the, the War of the Worlds, and I stayed up late to watch it, and it scared the crap out of me. And I was obsessed with these Martians and their death rays. For the next decade, pop culture keeps the dream of life on Mars alive. At the same time that scientists are learning more and more about the inhospitable forces at work in the universe. On November 28, 1964, the six-year-old National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, launches Mariner 4 on a flyby mission to Mars. One current in one panel. Off we have current on the panels. Eight months later, Mariner snaps 22 black and white images of the surface of the red planet, and 5,000 years of speculation about Martian life is transformed overnight. You know, when Mariner 4 went by, it surprised us like, oh my gosh, it's just like the moon. It's completely lifeless, completely dead. Mariner 4 changed everything. But there was enough there to see no canals, no civilizations, no little green men, for the popular world to see that whole Martian empire smashed was a big moment. Despite this scientific evidence, the War of the Worlds still has the power to cause panic. Uh, traffic coming off the Youngman Expressway is completely at a standstill. Uh, we've asked you to please stay away from the area. Uh, there have been fires and explosions. So we're not exactly sure how many people have been killed or injured, but they're calling in all available ambulances from the area. On Halloween night, 1968, on the 30th anniversary of the original radio broadcast, WKBW Radio in Buffalo, New York, presents a modernized version of the Mercury Theater program. This time, the Martian invasion hits the U.S.-Canadian border. Uh, I'll be all right. I, I just want to say, Jeff, it's... Jeff, it's turning my way. Irv, Irv, can you hear me? K K three nine three. KK 393 to KH 2586. Can you hear me? Irv, can you hear me? Despite the fact that the broadcast is heavily promoted as a dramatization, with disclaimers broadcast 21 days in advance, every hour on the hour, local police report more than 4,000 phone calls from panicked listeners. A year later, in 1969, NASA launches Mariners 6 and 7. 200 more photographs of Mars confirm that the Red Planet is not a place where Martians might be planning our destruction after all. Hope for a Martian civilization fades until 1976, when one amazing image from NASA stuns the world. The 1970s see an explosion in unmanned exploration of the Red Planet. And the photos taken from orbit reveal more than just rocks and craters. It is now known simply as the face on Mars, a feature in the Sidonia region of the planet that looks like the result of intentional engineering. And this rekindles the passions of thousands of wishful thinkers. I can understand their passion about this, because were this to be genuine, it would be one of the most fantastic discoveries of all time in science, to find some monolith, some ancient structure on Mars. NASA insists the face is a natural geologic formation, a trick of light and shadow. 
But many people, eager to believe in Martians, think NASA's involved in a cover-up. Scientists would be the first people to be fascinated if that face on Mars was genuine. The evidence is simply not there. Much later, the Mars Global Surveyor spacecraft flew over this same landscape with cameras that could see at much higher resolution, looked at many different times of day, and it's just a hill. The fact that the face idea could continue to survive is another piece of evidence about this weird hold that Mars has on our imagination. Two Viking spacecraft launched in 1975 send back thousands of pictures from Martian orbit. And the results are the same as before. Mars is a dry, weather-beaten desert. But there is one more amazing find still to come. Later images reveal deep channels that appear to have been carved by water in the distant past. What we've observed on Earth is wherever we find liquid water on Earth and some sort of energy source, we find life. Then therefore, what we want to look for on Mars is where, a long time ago, there was also liquid water. In the quest for water, the Viking lander does something remarkable. It detaches from the orbiter, and without the aid of any modern computer guidance system, Viking lands on Mars. I am truly amazed when I look back at Viking as to you know, how they were able to do what they did and with the technology they had at the time. I figured those guys must have been a lot smarter than we were <laughs> to be able to get those things down successfully, and they did. I think it was a fantastic success to be able to do that. The Viking landers perform three life-seeking remote-controlled experiments. The first mixes Martian soil with water and other Earth elements to see if anything will grow. The second searches for organic compounds in the Martian atmosphere. The third burns a patch of the Martian surface and analyzes the ashes. Viking was the first attempt to do biology on another planet. And it was actually very impressive because we had never even been to Mars before. And we were going to do some of the most ambitious biology experiments ever attempted. At first, they think they found life but the results are a false positive. The overwhelming scientific consensus is definitely that Viking, rather than finding life on Mars, was only able to sort of discover an interesting aspect of Martian surface chemistry. This tantalizing result would inspire another Mars landing mission. It would take 22 years, but in 1998, the tiny Mars Pathfinder roams the surface of the red planet. With this success behind them, NASA sends the first of two new Mars exploration rovers aloft on June 10th, 2003. And lift off of the Delta II rocket with the Mars exploration rover. Its twin launches just weeks later. And both undertake the lonely voyage to Mars. Seven months later, on January 3rd, 2004, the first rover lands on Mars, armed with a new close-up camera and rock grinder, which search for evidence of microscopic life inside the frozen rocks. It is followed just weeks later by the second rover, with similar stunning results. These NASA missions continue the quest for water and ultimately life itself. Upcoming missions may eventually lead to the manned exploration of Mars, but it seems highly unlikely that any of these expeditions will discover the creatures of science fiction. It's funny that Mars, after all the exploration we've done, is still kind of a fantasy planet to a lot of people. We still somehow hope there's Martians there, or we think, gee, maybe they're underground, or maybe their cities are covered in sand or something. We had a culture for so long of uh, uh, thinking about that planet as being a place that had life. We want neighbors in space. And Mars is so darn close, and if only there was life there, it would make our solar system so much more fun, if nothing else. 
Despite the scientific evidence, this great tale of interplanetary invasion lives on. In 2005, Steven Spielberg's sci-fi blockbuster rekindles the terror of invasion. Now, in Britain, a major computer animated motion picture is in development. The movie is the brainchild of musician and filmmaker Jeff Wayne, whose creative energies have been driven by this story for almost 30 years. In 1978, he and his father buy the rights to the H.G. Wells story and create, of all things, a musical interpretation of the classic novel. The work is set in Wells' time, but the music is inspired by 1970s rock. Famed British actor Richard Burton reads dramatic passages from the book. The Martians released their black smoke, but the ship sped on, cutting down one of the tripod figures. Instantly, the others raised their heat rays and melted the Thunder Child's valiant heart. When the smoke cleared, the Thunder Child had vanished forever, taking with her man's last hope of victory. The leaden sky was lit by green flashes, cylinder following cylinder, and no one and nothing was left now to fight them. The Earth belonged to the Martians. The original album is a hit in the UK and sells over 13 million copies worldwide over the next 27 years. H.G. Wells is a, uh, an author of uh, great vision and The War of the Worlds just got my nod. And I think probably because H.G. did write it as this episodic adventure, uh, it was easy to cut off moments within a block of the story and compose a sequence, and I followed the chapters exactly as H.G. did. I think the appearance of a musical version of War of the Worlds really says a lot about the uh, sort of the viability and the flexibility of this basic story. Jeff Wayne orders paintings for the album, which offer a striking new interpretation of the Martian fighting machines. The paintings were quite extraordinary at that time and uh, were really kind of a definitive version of the walking tripods. When Jeff Wayne commissioned these paintings, and that was really reminded us of how striking the H.G. Wells concept was. Over the next two decades, Wayne's passion for the story inspires video games and an ever-expanding range of merchandise, and now a major animated feature film. Why does the idea of something horrible from Mars continue to strike a chord? Why is it something that you can still make into a popular sensation? Maybe you just put it all together and you've got something that's got a hook in people's minds that just won't let go. For more than a century, H.G. Wells's book has never been out of print, and Mars remains a pivotal character in our thoughts about life from beyond. Maybe we see Mars as our evil twin, that we look at it and see a planet that is in some ways like Earth, but it has never been associated with good things from Earth. The popular imagination about Mars has so often had to do with threat and terror and evil. The power of Mars over our imagination is still there. And as for H.G. Wells' Martians, for all their power, how did man survive? As I emerged from Baker Street, I saw far away and over the trees the hood of a Martian giant. He appeared to be standing still, and scattered about it in a dozen of their machines, stark and silent, were the Martians, dead slain by the disease bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. The War of the Worlds is over, for now. Now listen, everybody has a cell phone stuck in one ear and an iPod in the other. We use words like Google, blog, and spam. We got robots on Mars, cat cloning in L.A. I made it happen. How William Shatner changed the world. Tonight at 8, only on the History Channel.